How were the ancient cities different from modern cities, and how were they similar? Well, let me start with how they're similar, because this is what archaeologists have grabbed onto. Um, we know cities to be um, physically very dense, mm -hmm. lots of people living very close to each other, narrow streets. And when we excavate ancient cities in Mesopotamia, this is what we find. Uh, so we assume, I think a bit naively, that because uh, ancient cities looked like modern cities, that they must have been like them in other ways, especially um, in terms of how people were socially structured, how they went about their economic lives. And here's where we have a big difference. Mesopotamian cities, starting around uh, 3000 BC, they seem, to be they seem to be places where uh, farmers lived. And this is something that's very different from how we envision cities. You know, today, cities are places uh, of consumers. Um, it's the rural hinterland that's the productive places. That's where the farmers live. That's where the herders live. But in these early Mesopotamian cities, despite this similarity in density, they seem to be places that are largely inhabited by people who are agriculturally productive. And were they farming within the cities, or were they then leaving the city's borders to go out and farm in the nearby hinterland? They're, they're leaving the cities. They're, they're waking up in the mornings, um, taking their animals and their farm equipment and marching out to the fields, doing their work, and, and coming back. And, and what's particularly fascinating for Mesopotamia is this daily back and forth movement has left an inscription on the uh, in the ground um, that we can find sometimes via satellite imagery. It doesn't seem to make much sense. You know, you could uh, have a, a an easier life if you lived out near your fields. So why? And this is a big question: Why nucleate when your when your um, your job is somewhere else? And uh, we suspect that part of this may be because of security. Mm -hmm. um, people living together can be safer. And indeed, we find a lot of these early cities have very thick walls around them. So it's a place where you could retreat to uh, at night. Uh, but I suspect that it may be more than that. It may be just that this is the proper way to live. And this is certainly something that we today feel about cities. If you are an mm -hmm. urbanite, you live in a city because that's kind of who you are. And I suspect that this was true from a very early time. Especially since they lack all the low density entertainment options that we have today. You have, you have no <laughs> cable television, you have no, uh, no internet to surf on. Just so you, know, you need some neighbors as a, yeah. as a consumer city. And they were also, but they were also bringing the sheep in at the end of the day, which presumably also mostly reflects security as well. Too. Yes, quite likely. Um, when we do excavate um, uh, houses in some of these early cities, we do find open spaces within them. There's uh, obviously there are rooms that we can tell were roofed, and this must have been where people were living. But very often there's an adjacent open space that uh, seems to be where maybe household animals were held. And the first notable town, the one that inspires Jane Jacobs' vision of New Obsidian, is Chattelhoyuk, right? That's and that's about that's. Uh, maybe six or seven thousand BC. Why is Chattel Hayek not a real city? What's the, is it just the population size or are there other things that are missing in Chattel Hayek that we would expect to see in a city? Yeah. Uh, getting back to your initial question, you know, Chattel Hayek has some close similarities to the sort of density that we expect when we look at an ancient place to decide whether it is or is not a city. Uh, the, the houses within Chateau Hoyuk are very, very closely connected. In fact, mm -hmm. so closely connected that there's no streets. Um, people entered their houses at Chateau Hoyuk through holes in the roof, which as you can guess would lead to incredible density. But it's the inequality that causes uh, many uh, of us archaeologists to question the urban status of Chateau Hoyuk. In each one of these very densely packed houses, we find more or less the same range of material culture. No one house seems to really be marked off as controlling access to wealth in a way that we associate with inequality in cities today. Um, I would hesitate to say it was a place of egalitarianism. Hard to There's know, no right. such thing as that, really. Um, but certainly the, the very obvious material signs that we archaeologists look for, just they're just not there and they don't appear for a few millennia. When we think about the, so moving forward from Chattel Hayek to 4,000 years BC, there, there really are two different population centers within Mesopotamia that we know now, right? There's a southern Mesopotamian cluster and a northern Mesopotamian cluster. Can you tell us a little bit about that and the, the parallel tracks of these two areas? Yeah. Uh, most famously, there is the city of Uruk mm -hmm. in southern Mesopotamia. This is today with the south of Iraq. A famous city uh, not only to us archaeologists, but also to the Mesopotamians themselves because of things like the Epic of Gilgamesh, one of the earliest pieces uh, of, of literature. Uh, which make it clear that Gilgamesh, this great king, was the founder of the city and, and he built the city wall, caused it to be built. 
we archaeologists, we love, we love creative individuals. Mm -hmm. We love to see somebody who has a vision and cause things to happen mm -hmm. through power or sheer will. But I, I suspect that that wasn't, didn't very often happen in the <laughs> right. past. But, but it makes for a good story. It, it, it makes it, for a wonderful story. <laughs> and uh, we, we love to look at these southern cities and connect them with a new technology, the technology of irrigation. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the de deliberate application of water onto fields. This is a wonderful technique for guaranteeing that your crops will grow, that they'll be reliable, and that they'll be abundant. And if you're going to nucleate a lot of people in one place, you need to have a guaranteed food source for them. So it seems that in the southern, in, in southern Iraq, at places like Uruk, we have a close connection between this new irrigation technology and the rise of cities. Now, confusing this is more recent research in the north of Mesopotamia, and this is an area that's today northeastern Syria, where we find cities, one particular city called Tel Brak, which is a little bit earlier. This is around 4000 mm -hmm. BC, but in an area that has never really seen irrigation, yet it grew to be a very large place um, very early. So the borderline population? Uh, perhaps 15,000 people. Wow. Uh, which sounds small to us, but from a historic perspective, quite large. Yes. Say. And this is kind of really confused things because we've been working on this model that irrigation and cities kind of go hand in hand. They, they develop simultaneously. But here's a case where that clearly did not happen. And it was simply rain fed agriculture that was sustaining a very large, a very large center. We like to turn to economic justifications for these places, um, for their durability. And certainly, uh, an environment is important because cities can't survive unless they have a productive hinterland. But I suspect that at a place like Tel Brak, the durability of this place may have been um, ideological rather than pure economics. Uh, it may be that uh, there was something about this place, some meaning about this place that brought people back to it repeatedly, kept them there, and brought new people in. And I suspect that this may have had to do with religion. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the early excavations at Tel Brak, almost 100 years ago, found a very large structure that we interpret as a temple. Mm -hmm. It was full of very small carved bits of stone and bone that looked like idols. They have enormous eyes, a single eyebrow, which was considered to be very sexy in later Mesopotamian sure. time periods, um, in the thousands. And this is really a very early and, and unique uh, occurrence. It suggests that um, if these idols were brought to this place by pilgrims, by people who saw them as uh, tools for interceding with them and the gods, that there was an ideological reason for being here. This, is, this was the right place to be because this is where you were close to the cosmos. So it may not have been an ideal place to live. It may not have been economically the best place. It may have been crowded or smelly or who knows but you are closer to the divine there. And that will keep people, people will tolerate a lot if they believe that this is the right place to be.